And hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another AP World History Modern AMSCO reading with your host, Modern Entertainment, where today we are reading Chapter 2.7, Comparison of Economic Exchange. And now I hope you all exchange clicks with the like button for me as you all enjoy today's video as you sit back, relax, and enjoy another AP reading. Now, let's dive right on in. Quote, Wealthy merchants bring in big cargoes, which they unload and unhastingly send into the markets without thinking in the meantime of any security or checking the accounts or keeping watch over the goods, end quote. Abdu Razak, Description of Calicut 1442 Essential Question What were the similarities and differences among the various networks of exchange in the period from 1200 to 1450? Calicut, known as the City of Spices, a market city where merchants traded their goods for pepper and cinnamon from India and a variety of goods from other areas as well, in some ways, such as its ability to provide security and the diversity of people who patronize the markets, Calicut was like another big trading cities along the well-traveled trade routes. In other ways, such as the type of currency it used and how the polity or governmental unit made money or in trade. It differed from trading cities elsewhere. The similarities and differences among trading cities were also reflected in the larger trading networks. Similarities among networks of exchange. Several major trading networks connected people in Africa, Europe, and Asia in the years between 1200 and 1450. The Silk Road through the Gobi Desert and mountain passes in China and Central Asia to Southwest Asia and Europe on which merchants tended to specialize in luxury goods, the monsoon-dependent trade routes in the Indian Ocean linking East Asia with Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Southwest Asia, on which merchants exchanged goods too heavy to transport by land, the Trans-Saharan trade routes from North Africa and the Mediterranean Basin across the desert to West and East Africa, on which merchants traded salt from North Africa with gold from the kingdom south of the desert. While, on, while each exchange network had its unique characteristics, all were similar in their origins, purpose, and effects. Origins Interregional trade began well before the Common Era as Aegean cultures consolidated into stable settlements. The trade that flourished between 1200 and 1450 built on the routes these earlier traders and conquerors first traced. As kingdoms and empires expanded, so did the trade routes they controlled and traveled. The post-classical trading networks also needed the stability of established states to grow and expand. Stable kingdoms, caliphates, city-states, or empires assured merchants that the routes and the merchants themselves would be protected, which is why the wealthy merchants in Calicut could walk away from their cargoes knowing they would not be stolen. Stable Paul Police also supported the technological upgrades that made trade more profitable. Nautical equipment such as the magnetic compass and latine sailed, high-yielding strains of crops and saddles to allow for the carriage of heavy loads of goods. Purpose The trading networks shared an overall economic purpose to exchange what people were able to grow or produce for what they wanted, needed, or could use to trade for other items. In other words, their purpose was primarily economic. However, as you have read, people exchanged much more than just products. Diplomats and missionaries also traveled the trade routes, negotiating alliances, and proselytizing for converts. Together, merchants, diplomats, and missionaries exchanged ways of life as well as economic goods. Effects All the exchange networks also experienced similar effects. Because of the very nature of a network, which can be described as a fabric of cords crossing at a regular distances, knotted for strength at the crossings. The trade routes all gave rise to trading cities, the knots that had held the network together. Routes, trading cities, and here's a chart for them. Route, Silk Roads. Trading cities, Chang'eng, present-day China. Samarkand, present-day Zuber Kitsun. Aleppo, present-day Syria, Mosul, present-day Iraq. Route, Indian Ocean. Trading cities, Malacca, present-day Malaysia. Calicut, present-day India. Hormuz, present-day Iran. 
Mombasa, present-day Kenya, and then Alexandra, present-day Egypt. Route, Trans-Saharan. Trading cities, Gao, Timbuktu, both present-day Mali, Marrakesh, present-day Morocco, Cairo, present-day Egypt. And then also below that, we can also see an image as well, demonstrating the Strait of Malacca on a map. And with the caption, the shortest route from East Asia to Southwest Asia on the Indian Ocean trade route was through the Strait of Malacca. Hope you, also, if you'd like, you can pause the video to enjoy the map, but let's continue on with the reading. The growth of trading cities gave rise to another effect of the trading networks, centralization. Malacca, for example, grew wealthily from the fees levied on ships and cargoes passing through the Strait of Malacca. To prevent piracy, Malacca used its wealth in part to develop a strong navy, an endeavor that required centralized planning. Trading cities along each of the trade routes underwent similar developments, using their wealth to keep the routes and the cities safe. Another aspect of trade in the cities that encouraged centralization was a desire for a standardized currency. Why the accepted currency sped up transactions and enabled merchants to measure the value of products. And then underneath that caption I just read, or area I just read, there was an image with the source La Madrasa Olo Big Du Rajasthan Samarkade um, Azubekistan with the author Jean Pierre Delbira from Paris, France. With the caption, Many trading cities also became known as centers of learning. This is the Og Beg Madrasa Islamic Religious School that was built in Samarkand between 1417 and 1422. Differences Among Networks of Exchange Despite their similarities, the networks of exchange were different in some ways, especially in the goods they exchanged, the nature of the routes and transportation, the technologies they inspired, and the religion they spread. Now, here we have another chart. Routes, Salk and Silk Roads. Goods, East to West. Silk, Tea, Spices, Dyes, Porcelain, Rice, Paper, and Gunpowder. From West to East, Horses, Saddles, Fruit, Domestic Animals, Honey, and Textiles. Transportation, Horses, Camels. Technologies, Saddles, Koran, Versailles. Religious. Buddhism from South Asia and to East and Southeast Asia. Neo-Confucianism from China to Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. Islam from Southwest Asia to South Asia. Alright, Route, Indian Ocean, and Mediterranean Basin. Goods from East Africa, Gold, Ivory, Quartz, Animal Skins. From Southwest Asia, Citrus, Fruits, Dates, and Books. From southern India, textiles, peppers, and pearls. Transportation, dows and junks. Technologies, stern rudder, lateen sail, astrolabe, magnetic compass. Religions, Buddhism from South Asia to East and Southeast Asia, Neo-Confucianism from China to Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. Islam from South Asia to Southeast Asia. Christianity from Mediterranean Basin. Route, Trans-Saharan, Goods, North to South, Horses, Books, Salt, South to North, Gold, Ivory, Cloth, Slaves, Techn Transportation, Carans of ca Caravans of Camels for Carrying Goods, People Walked, Technology, Saddles to Increase Load Bearing, Religions, Islam from Southwest Asia and North Africa to Sub-Saharan Africa, the trading networks also had unique currencies and commercial practices. For example, at one time, silk was not only a commodity, but also a currency. In places in Southeast Asia, tin ingots were used as currency standard. West African states used cowrie shells as currency. In time, however, states shifted to a money economy based on gold and other metal coins. To make commerce less bulky, the Chinese invented flying cash, see topic 2.1 or a previous video in this playlist, and establish the precursors of banks including the practice of extending credit. The image below that little passage I just read has the caption 
Phanem coins from the, the Eastern Gupta Dynasty in Kalinga, 1078 to 1434, with the source Wikimedia Commons and credit Sujit Kumar. Also, you can pause the image anytime to enjoy all these lovely images that are on screen. However, back to the reading. Social Implications of Networks of Exchange The rising demand for luxury goods spurred efforts to make production more efficient than it had been. China went through a period of proto-industrialization as it sought to meet the demand for iron, steel, and porcelain, see topic 1.1 or a previous video I have in a previous playlist. New business practices such as partnerships for sharing the risk of investment began to emerge. The production of goods such as textiles and porcelain in China and spices in South and Southeast Asia increased to meet demands. As the amount of goods increased, the volume of trade on maritime trade routes began to supersede that of the overland trade routes. Larger ships were needed as well as improved navigational knowledge and technology. Labor The demand for labor rose along with the growing demand for products. The forms of labor from earlier periods continued. Free peasant farmers, craft workers or artisans in cottage industries, people forced to work to pay off debts, and people forced into labor through enslavement. Trade in slaves was common along the Indian Ocean and Trans-Saharan routes. Large-scale projects, irrigation, canals, military defenses, great buildings called for the work of thousands of organized laborers. Kinship ties often played a role in coordinating these large-scale projects. An observer in the Vijayan Empire in South India in the 1300s describes the work of completing a giant reservoir. Quote, In the tank, I saw so many people at work, and there must have been 15 or 20,000 men looking like ants, so that you could not see the ground on which they walked. So many there were this tank the king portioned out amongst his captains, each of whom had the duty of seeing that the people placed under him did their work, and that the tank was finished and brought to completion. End quote. Narrative of Domingo Pays, 1520 to 2022. Or 1520 to 1522. Oops. Social and gender structures. The typical social structures during the period between 1200 and 1450 were still defined by class or caste, and societies, with rare exceptions, remained patriarchies. There were, however, areas where women exercised more power and influence. For example, even though the vast Mongol Empire was a patriarchy, Mongol women had somewhat more freedom than women in most other parts of Afro-Eurasia. Mongol women moved about freely and refused the burqa from the west and foot binding from the east. Women were also often top advisors to the great Khan. In Europe, women worked as farmers and artisans, and they had their own guilds. In Southeast Asia, women were skilled in the practices of the marketplace, operating and controlling marketplaces as representatives of powerful families. Outside of these limited areas, however, women within other major regions still experienced far fewer opportunities and freedoms than men in virtually all aspects of life. Environmental Processes The interconnections that spurred so much vibrant economic and cultural exchange also led to a steep population decline as merchants, diplomats, and missionaries transferred the bubonic plague and other infectious diseases along the trade routes. The plague, named the Black Death, contributed to the decline of once great cities, such as Constantinople. Most people that at a, least a third of Europe's population died during this period. China experienced outbreaks in the 1330s and 1350s, causing tens of millions of deaths. Changes in trade networks led to cultural diffusion and the development of educational centers in cities such as Canton, Samarkand, Timbuktu, Cairo, and Venice. Political instability in and increased agriculture strained the environment. For example, soil erosion from deforestation or overgrazing forced growing populations to migrate to other areas. And ladies and gentlemen, that concludes chapter U or should I say unit 2, chapter 2.7. I hope you enjoyed the reading as much as I did, and now it's time to share some thoughts. So the first thing I'm going to see is that one, the essential question did kind of answer itself here within the reading. One major theme, once again, is that 
here we're starting to see the development of economies and also as you can see here we kind of see a sort of um i guess you could see a a glimpse uh, into the future of industrialization what I mean by this is because with the industrialization, it was mainly focused on consumerism and massive production. However, during this time period, you can also say we're getting a slight glimpse of that, where it will soon happen a couple centuries later. Because this is shown through China's proto-industrialization, where because they had a high demand for certain amounts of their products like porcelain and some of their other goods, manufacturing and basically the proto-industrialization as well as systems like the cottage system were implemented to make sure that production demands could be met for trade also here we can definitely see that being the major theme as well as some other things like for starters we can definitely see that the three trade routes silk roads indian ocean and trans-saharan routes are all very vital to all of this period because they actually help connect the continent as well as the people who live here or live in Afro-Eurasia. Meanwhile, each one having different purposes and also being useful for different things like different sea routes and also other routes. However though, there also were a lot of other benefits and also a lot of other items traded, which will also be seen as a continuity going into the period of 1450 to 1750. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, please hit the like button. And remember, you can also subscribe if you'd like, and if you can always unsubscribe if it ever becomes an inconvenience. And please remember to hit the notification bell to stay up to date on when I post more content. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, Chapter 3 is, sorry, or Unit 3, e, Chapter 3.1, will be beginning in a different playlist if you choose to continue the AP readings, which I hope you do, because Chapter because Unit 3 certainly is a very holy unit. But I hope you enjoyed the video, and please have an amazing day or night. Stay safe, stay happy, and remember, ladies and gentlemen, to stay entertained.